God, I'm running for your heart. I'm running for your heart. Till I am a soul on fire. God, our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. When I was growing up, I went through confirmation in the 7th and 8th grade. I was confirmed on Palm Sunday, and I took my first communion on Easter. But in confirmation, you, uh, we were required to have memory verses. Pastor Phillips would have a, uh, a binder for us full of uh, 100 verses that we are invited to memorize throughout the year. And of, of course, uh, we did our best. You'd memorize it as much as you could for that Wednesday night meeting. Well, there was a line rendered in our uh, text for today, and it says, Jesus began to weep. Well, in the King James Version, I actually like its translation better. It simply says, Jesus wept. Now, there are two things that you need to know about this verse as far as it contains, pertains to my confirmation class. One, it's a great piece of biblical trivia. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Very good. The second is, it's always the first verse that every confirmation always says in confirmation class for memory verse. Do you, do you have your memory verse? No. What do you say? Jesus wept. Yeah. That, that verse, for a very long time, has been actually very little to me, except as a pleasant memory of childhood cuteness. But as the years have moved on, it has grown in more importance to me. People I have known and loved most of my life have died in recent years. My mother, both my grandmothers, and two uncles. And like Jesus, I have wept. Unlike Jesus, I have not had the power to bring back my loved ones to life. All Saints Day is kind of one of those oxymoron kind of days, a celebration of both sorrow and joy, of loss and anticipation, of remembrance of things past and hope of things to come. On this day, we not only remember the great and celebrated saints of the church, we also remember the seldom celebrated saints who fill up our personal lives. Most of all, this day is a day on which we smile through our tears, trusting in God's promise that all of our yesterdays can be seen as a prelude to a glorious and never-ending tomorrow. The gospel story of raising Lazarus is part of a larger story, uh, and a very important story that takes up um, most of chapter 11 in the Gospel of John, as well as a little bit of chapter 12. And it goes a little bit like this. We only got a little snippet. Um, Lazarus is the brother of Mary and Martha. And you know Mary and Martha. You've heard a lot about them before in the past. Lazarus is, a, I would say, Jesus' best friend. He is described to Jesus as one whom he loved. Je Lazarus is very, very sick. And his sisters send word for Jesus to come and help him. I mean, after all, here's Jesus, this teacher, this rabbi, who's performed miracle upon miracle, healing upon healing, surely for his best friend, Lazarus. He'll come and heal him. He says something. Now, here Jesus pulls a shocker on us. He receives word, but he doesn't go. He doesn't go. He says something about this illness not being one that leads to death, but ultimately will glorify God. So he sits around for two days and does nothing. Then suddenly, according to the gospel, he gets up and he says, let's go to Judea. His disciples are startled for a couple of reasons. One is, why now? And the other is, hey, Jesus, I don't want to tell you this. I'm just trying to remind you. There are people in Judea who want to kill you. This might not be the smartest move. And Jesus says something a little enigmatic, that is something mysterious, this time about daylight and darkness and those in the light not stumbling. The disciples, again, don't really quite get it. Then he says, besides, we're going to find Lazarus and we're going to wake him up. And his disciples are like, oh, okay, well, if he's asleep, he'll be, 
He'll be fine. Then Jesus speaks plainly, guys, Lazarus is dead. So let's go. Then the one who is later called the doubter, doubting Thomas, has a great act of faith, a great act or of at least courage. Thomas says, okay, let's go so that we can die with him. He still doesn't get what Jesus is doing, but he's willing to go along with Jesus anyway. I don't know about you, but I have days like that. How about you? Where you don't know what Jesus is up to, but let's go along with it anyway. So Jesus goes to Bethany. And he meets people who tell him that Lazarus is dead and that he's been in the tomb for four days. Four days! Martha finds Jesus, and when she gets to Jesus, she takes all her grief out on him, blaming Jesus that her brother has died, angry with Jesus for not following her timeline, for not coming right away. And Jesus starts talking about the resurrection, He's like, hey, you believe in the resurrection? And she kind of blows him off. She says, yeah, 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 I know about the resurrection, yada, 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 but my brother is dead now. And Jesus says to her, I'm talking about right now. Right now, the resurrection. Those who believe in me will live. Do you believe? And she looks into his eyes and she says, I believe. And now comes to the part where the story where we read today. Mary is weeping. Her friends are weeping. And Jesus becomes, quote unquote, greatly disturbed. I don't know about you, but anybody right now greatly disturbed? Anybody figure out that the world is not the way it's supposed to be? Does that make you disturbed in spirit? It makes me disturbed. Scripture says Jesus was greatly disturbed, and for the first time, for the first time, Jesus wept. He begins to show signs of grief over the loss of his friend, the friend whom he loved. Well, why now? Why, why, why is he crying now? Why didn't he cry before? What has greatly disturbed him? The Greek verb translated here, disturbed, has to do with the emotions of being disturbed, but also implies anger. Could it be that Jesus was weeping with anger and with the, that the power of death has over humanity? Perhaps so. I think the gospel writer of John wants us to go there. He wants us to see the great compassion Jesus has for the suffering and pain and the loss that we go through. Compassion, in this case, shows itself both as anger and tears. So Jesus goes to the tomb, still angry, still disturbed. He decides to act, and he acts dramatically. And as we listen to the story, we remember that for the people that this gospel writer is writing for, for the gospel of John, the events of Jesus' death and resurrection are already well known, much as they are known to us who gather here today. Like us, they know about that first Easter morning when they heard Jesus say, take away the stone, you make that likely jump that the stone on Easter morning was rolled away. As you hear about the bound corpse of Lazarus, you remember that Jesus, when he was resurrected from the grave, all of his linings were folded and left on the table in which his body once laid. We remember that. We see that in our mind's eye as we hear Jesus say, unbind him and let him go. Anybody here feel like you're bound in the stench and grief of death? Isn't it great to hear the words of Jesus say, unbind him and let him go? As the story moves on, this act of compassion by Jesus, the raising of the dead, of the one who already began to stink, was an act of, that had major repercussions for Jesus and for us. As soon as Lazarus walked out of the tomb, the plot for Jesus to be put in the tomb was hatched and set in motion. Lazarus coming out of the tomb sealed Jesus' fate. Lazarus coming out of the tomb meant that Jesus would have to go in. 
How fitting. For Jesus' mission as our promised Messiah was to take our place, to be a ransom for many, to take our punishment for our sins, not His, for He was the one without sin. And only with Jesus do the dead come to life. So what does that mean for us today? Lord, there's already been a stench for He's been in the tomb for four days. Well, let's face it. We all tend to think that there are some things in our lives that have gone, gone too far. Anybody here in, right now in your life can think of at least one thing that perhaps has gone too far, even for Jesus. There are problems in this world that will never be resolved or done away with. Jesus himself said the poor will always be with you. And we think that there are problems from our past that, we can, that can never be undone. Or relationships that can never be repaired. Some things have gone too far and they smell like death itself. When things smell bad, our desire is to bind them up and seal them in a tomb. We lock away our broken dreams, our damaged past, our hurtful relationships behind a stoic face and a vow of silence. We compartmentalize the poor in the shelters on the other side of town and place categories on them like lazy or addict. In this way, we protect ourselves from the stench of our own decay as individuals and as a society. Oddly, when the resurrection comes, the first thing Jesus does is insist that the tombs be opened and to unbind them and let them go. Before there can be resurrection, resurrection we must face the stench of death and decay in our own lives and in our culture and trust that there is one who has the power to bring new life even in the stench and face of death. What tombs would God have us open today in order for the power of Christ's resurrection to take place? What tombs would God have you open today in order for you to trust in the power of Christ's resurrection. The reality of the resurrection isn't something that we have to wait for. It's something we can embrace today. Yes, on this All Saints Day, the hope and the promise of our beloved loved ones being face to face with Almighty God right now, that's resurrection reality. But also knowing that today, today, we can live out the resurrection reality. With Jesus, the dead is brought back to life. That which seems hopeless finds hope. That which seems like a lost cause finds a new course and a new life. That relationship, that circumstance, which seems like it is sealed in a dark earthly tomb, with Jesus finds light and resurrection life. Folks, resurrection reality is for all of us today. For we have a Savior who knows firsthand what it means to go through pain and loss. We have a Savior who knows firsthand what it means to weep and what it, know, what it means to live in a world that is not the way it's supposed to be. We have a Savior, Christ the Lord, who gives us forgiveness in the midst of grudges, peace that passes all understanding, and a resurrection reality to be lived out every day. Today's message is a message of remembrance and hope. Let us remember the saints who have gone before us, both those who are great and shining examples of Christian character and virtue, and those who are known to just us, who show us the way to God, who hold on to the promise of a Savior. And let us look back today with fondness, and forward with desire and anticipation as we are invited to trust God in Christ will do for us what Jesus did for Lazarus. On the last day on God's holy mountain, we will gather in the great banquet of all people from all times and all places, and death will be swallowed up forever. As Isaiah says that God will, in the words of Revelation, wipe away every tear. Death will be no more. 
mourning and crying and pain will be no more. That's good news. On this All Saints Day, may we join with Mary and Martha and trust in our weeping and compassionate God who can and will make all things new for us and for all creation. Amen and amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. So we now sing one of my favorite hymns. When I am also on fire.